Today we're going to begin uh, Swami Vivekananda. He's the gentleman on the left. It is our own mental attitude which makes the world what it is for us. Our thoughts make things beautiful. Our thoughts make things ugly. The whole world is in our minds. Learn to see things in the proper light. This is one of my favorite thought, um, favorite quotes. And the idea about our thoughts making things beautiful and ugly, it has to do with our mindset. So today's philosophy is called Advaita Vedanta. It's a philosophical part of uh, Indian Hinduism. It's not religious in any way, but it's rather a different way of thinking. So as I said, Advaita Vedanta is one of the six philosophical schools of Hinduism. And it was first brought to America by this Indian monk, Swami Vivekananda, at the Chicago's World Fair in 1893. So, Swami Vivekananda arrived in Chicago at the World's Fair in 1893 in all of his robes and turban. He had spent two months on a boat from India, and his goal was to bring his philosophy to America. So, Vivekananda, when he explained Advaita Vedanta, it was so enthusiastically received by the people there that he ended up actually traveling around the country, believe it or not, almost like a rock star. People wanted to see what this this strange man from the uh, from the land of India had to say. Um, in, in fact, he had a lot of uh, famous followers. People like Leo Tolstoy, J.D. Salinger, who wrote Catcher in the Rye, Aldous Huxley, who wrote The Doors of Perception, Gandhi, George Harrison of the Beatles, they all were exposed to his teaching. Um, supposedly, J.D. Salinger, who wrote Catcher in the Rye, he wrote that during World War II while he was actually fighting. And after he learned, he was tortured by everything he'd seen. He'd seen the concentration camps. And after he heard the, the teachings and read the teachings of Swami Vivekananda, he ended up becoming a recluse, and he never published another book, although there's rumors he wrote books the rest of his life for himself. He never needed to have them published because he didn't need to have anybody like or dislike them. For him, writing was an individual purpose. George Harrison of the Beatles, if you like the Beatles, he had a song called I, Me, Mine, which is definitely influenced by the concept that, generally speaking, most of us are always I, Me, Mine all day long. And perhaps, you know, as he says, these tears, um, the I, Me, Mine viewpoint, the more we focus on that, potentially the more we suffer. There's a story about John Rockefeller. Now, John Rockefeller was uh, one of the couple of richest people in the world. Um, he was the oil guy, 30 Rock, where the uh, Saturday Night Live is filmed and the Christmas tree is, is, is Rockefeller. He had heard about Swami Vivekananda, and he went to his office, one, or went, to, went to where Swami was one day, and pushed his way through the secretary and went in, and Swami Vivekananda was in the middle of a meditation. And Rockefeller wanted to know what, what was this, this big hype about this guy. Rockefeller was very impatient. He wanted to know everybody wanted to talk to the swami guy and nobody really knows what happened in the conversation but he left and rockefeller appeared to be very upset when he left and when he came back the next day he came in and he threw a piece of paper on swami vivekananda's desk and the piece of paper had to do with charity apparently what swami vivekananda said is collecting more and more and more money for yourself is that really bringing you joy and if you understand the idea of um, philanthropy Rockefeller, after he became the richest, along with uh, Andrew Carnegie, he then began the idea of philanthropy of who could give away more money. His competition went from who could make more through manipulating workers and, and uh, suppliers. It went from that into how who could give away more. And apparently it happened after Swami Vivekananda spoke with him. So, Advaita Vedanta has a number of interrelated concepts. The first is the self and the ego. We've been talking about the ego. The second is the maya, which is the illusion. And finally, non-duality. Now, if you understand one and two, I'll be very happy. Number three, non-duality is wicked difficult. Some of you are going to get it and agree with it. Some of you are going to think it's a not for you, and that's fine. So, here's the question. How would you have been different if you grew up in a different time period? I'm not saying you guys would have dressed like this or had hair like this, but would you have? Ultimately, depending on the time period that we grow up, our fashions, our thoughts, our beliefs, our lives are going to be very, very different. Not because we choose it, but because potentially that's what society has made it for us. Our minds will coexist and interconnect with these particular time periods. So look at society today, our family, friends, culture, etc., etc. 
It plays such a big role in how you think and how you're conditioned. If you grew up in the 80s, you'd have the big hair. If you grew up in the 70s, you'd have the mohawk. If you grew up in the 60s, it'd be peace, love, and happiness. So the question is, how does society influence people today? Well, an example I think of is this crappy TV show, Catfish. It was based on a crappy made-up movie. Uh, they said it was real, but it wasn't. And the idea of catfishing somebody is to fool somebody online about who you really are. It wasn't something that was very prevalent. I'm sure it happened. But once they made the little crappy documentary, which wasn't a documentary, it was made up, now we've got a nation of people catfishing each other. It's a thing. It's known. Another show on MTV as well, the uh, OG Teen Mom or whatever it is, I saw an interview with a girl who was 12 who said, I can't wait until I'm 13 so I can be on this show. The idea that you're looking to be 13 and have a kid so you can get fame because you're on MTV is kind of questionable to me. And the idea is we are sponges. Our minds are sponges and we're so conditioned by the present moment. And maybe if the present moment, meaning in society, isn't great, we've got negative conditioning. Whatever differs between who you are and who you would be then could be called the egoic mind. The idea is you've accumulated all of this conditioning and all of your perceptions, and that's become your mind. This conditioned mind is where your repetitive thoughts are going to come from. This is just a re review a little bit from the other day. Some examples of the egoic mind. You miss the big shot or you trip and fall. I, uh... Cristiano Ronaldo is one of the greatest soccer players in history. He's a good-looking guy. He's a rich guy, amazing soccer player. I watched him in a game. Pass was made to him, and he went to shoot it, and he hit it over the net. And then he began looking at his shoe and looking at the ground. When you watched it in slow motion, he just missed the shot. But he, even he, needed an excuse for why this happened. Do you need to protect yourself and have an excuse to protect who you need everybody to think you are? If you fall down going down the stairs, you're going to need an excuse for why you did it. Otherwise, everybody else is going to think negatively of you. And the idea that we care so much about this is one of the tortures that the egoic mind gives us. Another example, how does judging make us feel superior or inferior? I heard a comedian and he said, when I feel bad, I heard him say it twice. One time he said, when I feel real bad, I just go to IHOP. And the other time he said, I just go to Walmart. And the concept is, I go there and I realize I'm not these people. I'm looking down upon them. Now, when I say this, some people laugh because it's, oh, it's so true. There are some circus freaks who are at IHOP or Walmart, blah, blah, blah. And then other people are thinking, whoa, wait a minute. I shop at Walmart. I eat at IHOP. Am I a less than? The idea of this judging is just is, is funny and tragic at the same time. Problems of the egoic mind, I like that thing in the bottom, speaking your mind, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing every day. We judge. We judge so much. Westerners are so analytical. We're always looking at how we're different, how we're better, how we're worse. Instead of where Eastern maybe looks more at how we are similar. It's the me versus we. Me is the Western view. We is more of the Eastern view. Comparison, as we've talked about, starts in school with class rank, rank and file. Problems of the egoic mind. We tend to feel we need to have an opinion about everything. And not only that, everybody needs to know what I think. Guess what? They don't. The idea of social media has some positives, has a lot of negatives. One of the negatives is everybody's got to, you know, chime in with their own opinion on everything. Eastern philosophy says you don't need an opinion on everything. You could just exist with what is. An opinion is, I like this, I don't like this. All of these aversions and all of these attractions really don't help us at all. The overanalyzing of life creates overanalyzing in our mind, which leads to negative mindsets. Social media reinforces us, as we said. The more than or less than illusion we've used to establish our value, it limits who we really are. If you think I don't want, most kids, I'll give you an example, they don't want to be called on in class because they might say the wrong answer. Well, guess what? I say the wrong answer sometimes. But the idea at some point somebody said the wrong answer and somebody laughed at them is enough to get them to never extend themselves because they don't want to be seen as a less than. The concept I give is you can hold on to the tree your whole life and be safe, but sometimes you have to go out of the limb because the sweetest fruit is found out on that limb. You might fall. You might have to take a chance. But when you stop seeing yourself as in fear if you're wrong, when in fact everybody is wrong, life becomes a little bit different. We stop limiting ourselves. 
I like it on the right side. Competitive meditation. Dang, he's pulling ahead again. The day will come when men will study history from a different light and find that competition is simply a thing on the way and not necessary to evolution at all. This is hated by most of my hard-achieving hard Western kids in class, which you're all Western kids, obviously. Why do we feel the need to compete with each other? Who are we proving ourselves to? We're really proving, our, we're proving ourselves that we're value. We, we've, we're, we're patting ourselves on the head. I won. I got a trophy. I'm, I have number two in the class. I'm not number one, so therefore I'm somehow inferior. This is a toxic mindset. Ramana Maharshi, we are originally unlimited and perfect. Later on, we take on limitations and we become the mind or the ego. The limitations we take on are the thoughts we have that we can't do something. Just saying you can't do something is a guarantee that you will not be able to. Are you really perfect as you are? I ask this question and kids don't say yes because they all have things that are wrong with them. And in the future, they'll be happy because those things will be fixed. I don't know if that's true. I think maybe a different mindset is what is needed. Most people see themselves as somehow inferior, but they're the one having that thought about themselves. I'm not as this or I'm not as that. Who gets to decide if you're inferior or not? It's you. You are creating your own limitation. Swami Vivekananda, this I have seen in life. Those who are overcautious about themselves fall into danger at every step. Those who are afraid of losing respect get only disgrace. And those who are always afraid of loss always lose. Whatever you think that you will be. If you think yourself weak, weak you will be. If you think yourself strong, strong you will be. Weakness is the one cause of suffering. We become miserable because we are weak. And by weak, I mean not physically weak, but emotionally weak. We have wept long enough. No more weeping, but stand on your feet and be men or women. Stand up, be bold, be strong, take the whole responsibility on your own shoulders and know that you are the creator of your destiny. All the strength and support you want is within yourself. Therefore, make your own future. The world is ready to give its secrets up if we only know how to knock. The strength and force of the human knock come through concentration of the human mind. So what is he talking about? Concentrating the human mind, if you really want to achieve something and you really put 100% concentration on that and you don't think that I can't do it, I can't do it, you are much more likely to achieve your goals. But we ourselves become victims. The whole line about no more weeping. We are victims. The woe is me. I'm not good enough. And as a result, we cower in the corner and we wonder why we're sad. Swami Vivekananda is really taking a hard step here and saying, no, you create your destiny. Stop limiting yourself with your viewpoints. His philosophy puts complete responsibility on us, the individual, for having the correct mindset. The past explanations and drama are just excuses we have. Everyone has excuses. I have excuses. And when I can't achieve something, there's an excuse in my head. That excuse is an obstacle to any progress. Arise, awake, and stop not until the goal is achieved. A lot of people will talk about Eastern philosophy being apathetic, and they often talk about not striving. Swami Vivekananda does not. He says, put your mind on one goal, and you will achieve that goal if your mind is set to achieve that goal. If you never give up, then there is no failure. But unfortunately, we say, I can't do it. It's too hard. Character has to be established through a thousand stumbles. I mean, there's stories of Edison, how many different filaments he had to try until he got a light bulb that worked. And ultimately, he invented the light bulb. But we very easily give up because we can't do it because we are our own limitation. The sandpaper of life. I use this concept a lot. The quote was, character has to be established through a thousand stumbles. Well, some of you have suffered some terrible, awful things that you should not have suffered any time in your life, not to mention in the first 17 years. One way is to look at those events as being an anchor, as an excuse, as a reason why you're not going to do whatever it is. Or you can look at them as the sandpaper of life that can shape you into someone who can overcome things. The greatest sin is to think you are yourself weak. The question is, are the bad parts of your life, are they weighing you down as anchors and keeping you from flying because of this mindset of woe is me? 
Or, and I mentioned this in another PowerPoint, are they angels that you're unaware of, these negative things, which are now teachings, if you allow them to be teachings, that will shape us and force our growth? Not every bad thing is a, is a teaching. There are things like deaths which are not designed as teachings. Everyone dies, but some deaths are more tragic than others. The question is, do you allow that event, even the worst event like that, to define your life into a victimization role? Or are they angels you're unaware of that are going to push you in a different direction? If you think back to the film Adjustment Bureau and the things that happened to Matt Damon's char uh, character in the film, those terrible events that maybe propelled him to get farther in life. The limitation is an illusion created by the mind, and Swami Vivekananda called it Maya. Maya is the illusionary life that we live through. Now, it's not saying that life isn't real. What the illusion is, it's an incorrect perspective or understanding and a flaw in our way of thinking. It's the egoic mind. The concept of the egoic mind is still misinterpreted by some of the kids in the class. I think they see it as someone has a bipolar mind, and also they see the ego as a bad thing. But in reality, that's not true at all. The egoic mind is more like separating yourself from what others think of you and genuinely being happy about yourself without feeling the need to get recognition from others. The purpose is to control the ego so as a human, we will not be so deeply attached with the Maya life, that's the illusion, and forget about our own true self. Like you said, you can't make it disappear, but you have to control it so you are a master of the ego and not the slave and live a life based on what others think of you. This is Putri Sedawan, one of my favorite students ever who came here from Indonesia and she knew of this philosophy. She lived this philosophy. So she was an asset to the class because she was able to explain to them as she does right here, if you can control your ego, you will not be a slave to it and then you can live a life, as she said, based on your own self-worth, not what you think others think of you. So Maya has a lot of different interpretations. Some are deeper than others. The egoic mind versus the true self is the first. How do you view yourself? Now, the idea of the monkey mind. Homer Simpson, in his mind, I think most people are like this all day long, as Swami Vivekananda says, the human mind is like that of a monkey. It's always constantly active by its own nature. Then it becomes drunk with the wine of desire, thus increasing its own turbulence, meaning like storminess. After desire takes possession comes the sting of the scorpion of jealousy at the success of others. And last of all, the demon of pride enters the mind, making itself of all importance. And those things, I mean, the idea of desire and jealousy and pride, they cause their negative ways of thinking which we cause our own misery with. The second one, and this is a deep one, and most of you won't get it, and that's fine. They say you are not your own body, but you're part of something much larger. They call it non-duality. Non-duality means there are not two things, there's only one. The concept, anything that changes cannot be you. Your emotions are gonna change, your thoughts are gonna change, your mind's gonna change, your body's gonna change. We should be focusing on what is real and unchanging, and only your awareness has been constant. In other words, you have to say, you remember your memories. That awareness has been on the whole time. You've changed. When you look in the mirror, you're a different person now. Bob Ross, the idea of a living canvas. We're going to talk about Bob Ross in a couple of days. Who do you identify yourself as? The original canvas, remember the uncarved block, or the painting society has made upon you. That painting society has made on you is the egoic mind. It's the way we look at life through comparison. Non-duality, and here's the deep slide, says we're not separate from one another, but on a deeper level, we are all connected by some sort of life force. So the idea all streams flow out of the same water source. If you understand the concept of the force in Star Wars, that interconnection, non-duality hot dogs make you one with everything now it's kind of weird because we're obviously separate i'm separate from you you're separate from me but non-duality says on a deeper level we are all interconnected and in fact we are the same there are not two there's only one here's the quote from yoda for my ally is the force and a powerful ally it is life creates it it makes it grow its energy surrounds us and binds us Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Luminous meaning um, not material, meaning more spiritual is what we are. 
and the belief that some people have that we're interconnected. Like, if you see a movie or you see a TV show and it's got all of the, the dogs who've been tortured and they want you to give money to the ASPCA to help them, you feel you feel sadness for those dogs. Or they can show some little kids. You'll feel sadness for them. You don't know those dogs. You don't know those kids. But there's something that connects us with them. There's some feeling that we have. Most people have. Um, it's interesting. Advaita Vedanta says, if we focus on our similarities and not our differences, we will see that there is an illusion called Maya, which is, in comparison, we're always seeing our differences. And being that we're always looking at our differences, we're always separate. It's me against the world. I have to compete against everybody. The dog-eat-dog -dog mindset. This is straight Western philosophy. And I'm not saying it's not good. I'm saying it's bad, actually, because that competition, that drive, that drive is good, unless that drive drives you insane. So Charlie Brown, this was in the other day in the article from Osho. Charlie Brown in the blocks. He builds a wall around himself with his blocks until he's stuck in a prison of his own making. One interpretation of that story is that we cause our own misery. We make our own mental thought prisons. A second interpretation is we create walls of separation in how we perceive ourselves with everybody else. We end up being lonely because we're disconnected from everybody else. We think we are alone. Alienation, and this is kind of deep, but the alienation leads to a life of yearning. We want to be connected again. We want to have unity. The idea is a little child, we were attached to our mother, quite literally. And then our mother kept us alive via breast milk. At some point, I don't know at what age, age one or age two, we all of a sudden begin to realize we are separate from mother. We cry and mother or father picks us up and holds us again. The rest of our life, when you really think about it, what we are yearning for is to be included, to be connected, to be in unity, to belong with others. Social life in the West is like a sound of laughter, but underneath it's a wail or a cry, and it ends in a sob. The fun is all on the surface. Really, it's full of tragic intensity. Now here in the East, meaning India, it's all sad and gloomy on the outside, but underneath are carelessness and happiness. The idea that we are a rich, opulent society with lots of great things, but inwardly, I think people have materialism as a way to give themselves short-term happiness, because inwardly, the way they think, as he said, it ends in a sob. You think you're any different from me or your friends or this tree? If you listen hard enough, you can hear every living thing breathing together. You can fe feel everything growing. We're all living together, even if most folks don't act like it. We all have the same roots, and we all are branches of the same tree. You may have understood the concept of the tree of life, the idea of like, like I mean, I've talked about this earlier since I'm talking about trees, but literally, I mean, half of your lungs are the trees in terms of your breathing apparatus is involved with the carbon dioxide oxygen exchange. We are much more connected than we realize. There's, now, this is an idea of Ramdas introduced. He says, like, this is an old TV with different channels. He said, on one channel, we are separate, and that's fine. But with Eastern philosophy, maybe you can change the channel, and you can see the places we were actually on the same plane, meaning we actually are the same. So if you look at different cultures, I don't know if you can read that, but that says aloha. Everybody knows it's from Hawaii, and if I ask kids what it means, they'll say, oh, it's hello and goodbye. Well... They say it when they see somebody and they say it when they're leaving, but what aloha means is it's an acknowledgement of the symbiotic relationship you have with everything in the universe around you. Humans, animals, plants. Symbiotic means working in, in, in connection. In other words, one needs the other interdependent. So as I said, means that one or both entirely depends on each other for survival. There's a story of a, of a guy, he did a test, he was in some country in Africa, and he put a uh, basket full of uh, fruits or uh, good, like, uh, sweets, and he had a number of uh, children, and he said, okay, we're going to have a race, whoever gets it first gets the food. Now, if we did that in America, if I told you over there there's a whole bunch of stuff you want in that basket, whoever gets there first gets it, you guys are going to knock each other over to get there first. But apparently what they did, the children took hands, and they run along together and got to the basket together singing Ubuntu. What does Ubuntu mean? 
Ubuntu means I am because we are. They all shared the materials. They all shared the fruits. That belief is more about the we than the me that's been drilled into our lives in Western culture. The idea of namaste, you may have heard of namaste. Um, namaste is when somebody would bow to you in like the Buddhist culture. Um, and the idea of, of actually what it is, by the way, if you've ever noticed, like when you pray, it's two hands together. Well, in namaste, you bring the two hands together, meaning two separate becoming one. And what you're actually saying is, I honor the place in you in which the entire universe dwells. I honor the place in you, which is of love of truth and light. When you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, we are one. It's saying how interconnected we are. Two hands turning into one, which is the namaste thing, which looks kind of like the modern uh, Christian prayer where you put two hands together. Okay, our final three slides. They're kind of a summarization of this. It's a little bit deep. As I've talked earlier, at, at birth, you develop an ego when you feel separate. Then, your whole life, all you want is to belong. You want to be connected. Any way you can, you want to bring back that feeling that you are one. The barrier to our happiness, especially in the Western world, is that we are futilely, meaning pointlessly, searching externally, outside of us, for what we already are. Eastern philosophy realizes that we are interconnected. We don't, and therefore we feel separate, we feel alone. If you understand non-duality, the non-difference between all, that means you don't have to seek, you're already whole and perfect. Now, I, I don't, it's hard to explain this. Some kids just get it. They feel like they're connected to others and they feel like they're connected to animals and other people don't get it and that's fine. But for tonight, write a journal on your general thoughts and we will continue tomorrow with some student journals. Thank you.